This is Digital Nation, where we explore some of the best of local TV. Whether it's above the clouds, working the earth, or making musical magic. This week, we meet some bright young things from across the UK. Plus, dramatic reenactments to mark the centenary of World War I. An art trail through the heart of the capital. And a treasured letter from Mrs Churchill. And don't forget to tell us what you think. Get in touch using the hashtag DigitalNation. First up, let's take to the skies over the Solent area with a 16-year-old who's being described as a prodigy pilot. This teenager's talent for flying was discovered while she was doing work experience, and the hope now is that her skills will take her to the top of the profession. The sky's the limit for 16-year-old Ariane. Only a month ago, she completed her first solo flight giving her a bird's eye view of our glorious Solon scenery. I loved it. So he felt sort of free as well because you're above everyone else. I'd never really seen where I lived from the air before, so it was really nice to see everything in sort of perspective and stuff like that. Ariane's talent was discovered when she was doing work experience at a flight school. Yes, we liked to take them for a short flight and I took Ariane up and asked her to take the controls of the aeroplane and straight away I could see that she had a natural aptitude for flying. So I just asked her to take the controls and she seemed very comfortable doing it and I asked her to turn left and turn right and, and she was just natural. She could feel the aeroplane moving with her. So uh, I did, we decided shortly after that that we ought to teach her to fly. Well, I'd never been in a plane before then so, and I'd always wanted to so I thought I might as well come here and see the sight. So, I decided to come here and I was here for two weeks doing work. Being as skilled as Ariane at such a young age is a rare thing, but it's also unusual to find a teenage girl in the captain's seat. Usually the boys that come to us have um, been learning to fly on flight simulators, they fly the aeroplane all over the sky, uh, but uh, Ariane didn't do that. She was able to control it very carefully and keep it within the limits of the aeroplane. It is quite rare to find someone with that skill at that age. Ariane's future looks bright. The flight school will sponsor her to complete a full European private pilot's license, which will help her pursue a professional flying career. Well, I'd like to go to university and um, uh, get a degree in either French and another language, maybe French or Russian maybe, and then just pursue a career in flying. We would like to see her take up a career in flying. She has a natural aptitude for flying and that talent ought to be honed uh, right the way through to commercial pilot's license. As commemorations marking a hundred years since the First World War continue, we head to Belfast, where hundreds of people have put on a reenactment of the Battle of the Somme. Complete with fire, costumes and sound effects, the impressive event marked the sacrifices made a century ago. It's a historical event, a reenactment of the uh, Battle of Somme. There was a lot of people from this area and other areas of Northern Ireland died the first day. We want to let people see, give them a rough idea of what it was like that day when men came out over the trenches and how they fell, how they were killed as soon as they stepped out. We're trying to remember the 36th Hulls Division, the men from West Belfast and went. A hundred years ago, our, our forefathers were sent off the war, not knowing whether we're coming back. So we feel, myself, I feel proud to try to remember those and make them proud of what we're doing today, remembering their, uh, the sacrifice they made for us. Today we're remembering 100 years on the women that was left behind. We're representing each role um, of women that carried out because without the women, they never won the war. I'm a Canary girl and we worked in the factories making the bombs that went on the planes. But it's nice to come here today and do that and remember the, the women's role in the war. It's a hundred years, you know, and there's a lot of people suffered, not just the men, but their families at home suffered and men never come back. So it's to show our appreciation and I think it should be celebrated. to Lancashire now and meet a 19-month-old with an incredibly rare condition. Clara is one of only 32 people in the UK with smith lemley opitz syndrome, which affects cholesterol. Despite huge challenges, Clara is surprising everyone with her progress. 
Clara is one of just 32 people known in the UK to have her specific syndrome. It's quite rare. It's called Smith Lemley Opitz. They class it as a wide spectrum, so it can range from somebody with very mild to the point that they go to university and might have side effects, you know, little problems. Or they can obviously be on Clara's side of the spectrum where it can affect everything about her, really. Born weighing just four pounds, seven ounces. It was seven months of wondering why their baby was underweight and having trouble feeding before the family got a diagnosis. Her syndrome means she cannot produce cholesterol. She, she was a miracle, really, because they did say they don't know how she did as well as she did without the cholesterol. Um, so really, the problem is because she's not producing any cholesterol, her brain is kind of starving. The diagnosis was that because of this, they don't know how she'll be. She might be stiff and floppy, you know, just not interacting. You know, it can be terminal. It just depends on each patient. And Clara so far is defying the odds. Diagnosed as high-end, her parents were advised she may not do much. But she's continued to surprise her specialist with laughs, rolls, attempts to speak and now even trying to stand. Her milestones really are finding her hands, putting her thumb to her mouth. It's the little things for us, I think, um, as a family, because you're told that they're never going to do anything. So the little things are massive to us. Like recently, she's just found her toes. So that to us is huge. And we want to get her to America because it's so rare over here. When we go to doctors, they tell us that they... They don't actually know much about it. They're, they're open about it and we'd rather that instead of going in thinking that we're being told everything that we should know. There's no charity for Smith and the Opitz and nobody knows who it is and nobody knows what it's about and we just want people to know and let, let them see what a fighter she is. Clara's case is raising awareness among medical staff and students here in Lancashire of a resilient group so small they call themselves family. Oh, I'm very proud. That's the thing. It's, um, it's a very hard syndrome to deal with, but I'm also very honoured to have her. <laughs>《Boots aren't made for walking, but that's just what they'll do in Bristol. Let's go there now and meet some older teams who keep playing an albeit slower paced version of the beautiful game. Are you ready? Let's start walking football. what it says on the tin really. It's a slower version of the beautiful game um, and it's aimed at over 50s. Um, so whereas they, they may have had to hang their boots up for their football career, they've now got the opportunity to be involved with football in their older age. Final whistle's gone and I'm here with Paul, the goalkeeper of one of the teams. How was it out there? It was all right, yeah, a bit of a drizzle, but uh, can't help that in this country, you know what it's like some days. Yeah. So uh, it was a bit wet. So it probably put me out on second half, keep a bit drier. But, uh, we won 5-4. Nice. He was winning all the way through, then he come back to three, four each. And then uh, we scored in the last minute. So I'm happy with that, please. Yeah. So what, what, talk through the basics then. So what are the rules? Are you allowed to slide tackle or anything like that? No slide tackle. Uh, no overheads. Uh, no inside the box. Um, you could pass throw it to someone, they could pass it straight back to you again. And... Uh, there's loads of rules, um, no penalties, all kinds of stuff like that. When we're in tournaments, this is mainly, but we do it as well when we can here as well. So It's a bit of fun, a bit of a kickabout. What would you say to the people that are at home who think, you know, I'd like to give that a go? Uh, yeah, I've asked for a few of them. We were at least laugh it off. So, oh, you're having a laugh, aren't you? So if you're listening, do this. <laughs> Run away to Glasgow now and meet some colourful characters from the world of the travelling circus. For these performers, the big top isn't just a job. It's a home and a way of life. A quick warning for the hot-headed among you, though. Don't try these tricks at home. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to Zippo Circus 2016. My dad was a farmer. 
loved circus, trained all the animals on the farm to do circus tricks. And uh, then he sold the farm and had his own circus that was in the 20s and 30s. And so I was born into the circus and that's all I've ever done. The great thing about a, this circus or any circus, it's good, clean family entertainment. I love the freedom, I love the people, I love traveling. I love living in the caravan. <laughs> I love what I'm doing. It's, it's fun. I love, the, I love the kids. And uh, it's a situation which I get to, to play through them, with them, and we are just having a, a thrill with it. Ah, it's a good feeling because uh, my type of comedy is not just for child or for the kids, it's for adults also. So look the, the reaction the face of the kids and uh, the adult, it's fantastic for me. I love to see happy people, and <laughs> that does go down to that. So when you see a people, uh, people enjoying and the kids smiling and being here all around, all together, you know, enjoying getting to uh, see spectacular things or unusual things. Yeah, it's fun, it's a gift. <laughs> oh, I just love to meet people. I'm a people's person. I like to meet them before the show, during the show, and there's two ways to do a show. You either do it at them, or you do it with them. And as I always say, at the end of every show, you're never too old, you're never too young. You're never too cool to go to a circus. Well, that brings us to the end of part one, which means have your writing equipment ready, it's quiz time. Which city was nicknamed the pen shop of the world? Was it A, Canterbury? B, Birmingham? Or C, Wells? Please write your answer down now. I'll mark it up to the break. Welcome back to Digital Nation. Before the break, we asked you which city was nicknamed the pen shop of the world? And the answer was B, Birmingham. Give yourself a tick if you got that right and just note this down. For a large part of the 19th century, the city's jewellery quarter was the centre of the world's pen trade. Now two pens of a different type as we head up onto a farm in Stirlingshire to meet a 22-year-old whose dream of working in farming has come true. Now she has her own herd of cows. She says, far from being old-fashioned, agriculture has a lot to offer young people. We have a mixed farm, it's 3,000 acres, uh, but we have arable land as well as cattle. Generally on a day-to-day -day basis I'll look after the cattle and I've got my own herd of Aberdeen Angus and Belgian Blues as well. But in busier times of year, like when it's sowing time or harvest time, I'll do a bit of the tractor work and help out with the arable when it's needed. For it's not an easy job, it's very demanding, but it's a very worthwhile job and you can definitely see your rewards. So there's plenty of young people coming into it, I think, but they just need to keep being involved to keep the industry going. I'm being a wee rascal today. Okay. Yeah, it's thought of more as a man's world, but I think there are more females coming into it. You see more and more that it's the girl that's taken over the farm than the boy, and obviously machinery is a lot more advanced these days, that it's easier for girls to do things, and well, girls can do just as much as men can, so there's no reason the girls can't get involved, is there? Obviously, it's such long hours, long days, you need to put in a lot of hard work and dedication to it, and yeah, you get your rewards, but it's a job that I love, and I've always wanted to do it. I knew from when I was a little girl, and I came out and started handling the cows, that that was farming was all I ever wanted to do. So, no, it's, it's a great job, and I definitely recommend it to anyone that wants to get involved, and I love doing it. Think of the heart of the capital and you'll probably imagine traffic, tall buildings and a ton of people. But London's Square Mile has been transformed into an outdoor art gallery with tens of sculptures and other installations dotted around the city. People became excited about the idea of a, an art trail, as it were, inside the city of London. Amongst all these tall buildings, we have these amazing open plazas, and we're using them as a, an art gallery in the street. You suddenly come across, unexpectedly, this marvellous thing, a, a piece of art that's here on the street. Well, I think a lot of the city is visual pollution and noise pollution. Um, 
I think people get to work ignoring much of what's around them and hopefully this is really uplifting. I mean, it rains at, at night and, you know, 5.30 5 p.m. in the winter, it, it's, it's, it's ugly out there and it's dark. And hopefully this warmth, this glow of LED will flood out on those wet paving stones outside. Well, the idea was to make a trail within the trail and because they are smaller and they are like leftovers, it was good to have a few that would link so you would encounter them again and maybe again. Some of them are in trees, which are now in green, but the leaves may fall in because they are whole for a whole year. In October, you will encounter maybe some that you don't see right now. We've shown that people really enjoy it. People will come, have their lunch, sit and look at a piece of art. It's, it's good and it gets people out and thinking of other things. Now, you might not think of the organ as a young person's instrument. They're large and complex and usually found in churches and chapels. Not exactly ideal for an hour of music practice. But in Nottingham, a teenager's organ playing has proved so successful, he's won a scholarship to Oxford University. Matthew Gibson has just secured an organ scholarship to Oxford University. One of the excellent things about playing the organ is the vast level of repertoire that you can get through. And also, of course, it's, it's a marvellous instrument to accompany singing. Um, and also to express oneself so clearly with such a wide variety of colour. The tradition of uh, organ playing in this country um, is, well, of course, it's worth keeping. I mean, we've got so many magnificent buildings, so many, many magnificent organs, that it'd be a shame to lose um, the use of them. Now, mastering the organ is not an easy thing. Pipe organs like this one use wind moving through the pipes to produce the sound. There are multiple keyboards to play and even a set of keys for your feet. Matthew has been playing the instrument since he was 11. A lot of people think it's really just a single sound. Um, but what you can actually do is shape the sound so it can be quite pronounced. Um, or indeed you can make it um, quite sharp, um, but also quite sweet as sort of a solo stop. Still to come, a puppet in denial, but first the surgeon who's a cut above the rest in Creative Kingdom. One of the foremost pioneers of 19th century surgery was James Barry, as you can see right here. Born in Dublin and moved to London, arrived in Edinburgh to study medicine in 1809 before becoming a qualified military surgeon. He served at the Battle of Waterloo, served in India, became chief medical inspector in Cape Town, and performed one of the first successful caesarean sections in history. He also became the inspector general for the entire British army, had a falling out with Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War, and then a stint in the Caribbean before becoming Inspector General of Hospitals in Canada. But it was only after death, in 1865, that the truth was revealed. James Barry was actually born Margaret Ann Bulkley and hid her true identity all her life, making her the world's first female surgeon. Proof once again that when it comes to creativity, innovation and cutting the patriarchy in Edinburgh Mint. To Cambridge now, where a letter from Winston Churchill's wife has been donated to the Churchill Archive. The thank you note has been treasured ever since it arrived on the recipient's doormat when she was just nine years old. So what did a young girl do to impress the wife of a Prime Minister? Of all her pieces of writing, the letter Barbara Taylor Bradford received from the Prime Minister's wife is the most precious. In 1943, the novelist, aged nine, held a jumble sale to raise money for the Red Cross aid to Russia. Afterwards, she wrote a letter to Clementine Churchill, enclosing a postal order for the princely sum of two pounds. And to her surprise, she received a thank you letter in return. I think the thing mostly was that at the end she said, your sincere friend. And it also shows the compassion and sincerity and thoughtfulness of Clementine Churchill. Now that letter will join the Churchill archives in Cambridge. 
a treasure trove of nearly 600 documents. But Lady Churchill's own role has been largely overlooked. She played a vitally important role in supporting and at times guiding her husband, which wasn't always an easy thing to do, given Churchill's um, personality. But she also took on certain causes and drove them with, with a lot of hard work. The Churchills were a major influence on Barbara's family her own father taking his name from Winston. And the inspiration Barbara received from the Prime Minister as a child has continued into adult life. When I was researching the book and reading the speeches again, I, I choked up and I thought this, how does he, did he know to pick the words and put them together and they have a rhythm and they're meaningful and they're inspiring. And I think what they did is they kept this nation going. Barbara has gone on from writing that letter when she was nine to becoming a huge fan of my grandfather's and, of course, of my grandmother's too. But she speaks about my grandfather with such affection and such admiration, which actually moves me. Now the letter that once so thrilled a nine-year-old girl will take its place as a piece of history to be enjoyed by future generations. And finally, let's meet some very particular stars of a Broadway show which is touring the UK. It tells the no-holds-barred story of the day-to-day -day struggles of the inhabitants of a fictional avenue Q, using some frank and fearless topics. So, how was the move from Manhattan to Manchester? The UK tour of Avenue Q had the Manchester audience in stitches on opening night. Our first night in Manchester last night was, was amazing. The audience, the reaction was mad. Following opening night, I got the chance to meet two of the stars. Now my job is a kindergarten teaching assistant, so I look after all the little monsters and help them grow up to be good monsters. Well, I am an investment banker and I live with my best friend, Nikki. Um, I don't have any problems. Uh, you know, I, I'm all good. Uh, I'm very organized. I like to keep things neat, but uh, I suppose one problem is my roommate, Nikki. He's, uh, he's an absolute mess. He annoys me because, you know, his, his pants are all over the floor and, you know, sometimes they're on my bed and there's crumbs in my bed and we had ants the other day, but, you know, he's great. You know, yeah, he's great. The show has been here before, so I have had chance to explore a little bit. I went to the Northern Quarter yesterday and had a wonderful time. <laughs> I was told that there was no sunshine and there was rain. I brought my umbrella, but I haven't had to use it yet, you know? Throughout the show, Rod struggles with his sexuality but he still seems to be in denial. Did you venture to the gay village uh, while you were here? No, 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 uh, no, I wouldn't go there. No, 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 I would never go there, no. Being part of Avenue Q means I have a great group of friends around me all the time, and we get to sing and dance and have a good time together, and it means that we can all help each other find our purpose. The talented performers sing, dance, and act out different characters whilst controlling their puppets all at once. And it's no easy task. I'd never picked up a puppet before in my life, so we had a very intense rehearsal period where we became puppeteers, and so now it feels like second nature. The puppetry side of things has been crazy because it was something I wasn't hugely experienced in and this style of puppetry is dif so difficult because it has to be so detailed. It's like rubbing your tummy and patting your head times 50,000, you know, it's crazy. Um, but it's been an amazing challenge and an amazing experience. That's all we have time for on this week's rundown of the best of local TV. If our stories have inspired you, don't forget you can catch up on previous episodes at bbc.co.uk slash digital nation. Or why not check out your local TV station's website? But until next week, have a good one. Bye bye.